Hello, everyone, and welcome to State House Futures 3, our third annual policy and strategy summit for state leaders looking to deepen democracy. I am Pete Davis, director of the Democracy Policy Network, or Deepen for short. We're an org that raises up ideas at the state level for deepening democracy. We have amazing panels coming at you today, policy panels on ideas ranging from social housing to restorative justice to the four-day work week. We have strategy panels on winning ballot initiatives, using polling and running for local office, and so much more. We also have almost, we're probably going to hit a thousand state leaders, staffers, and advocates for 50, from 50 states and even more territories in DC in the audience today. It's the biggest gathering of state policy and strategy for deepening democracy this year. And we see all of this as part of a shared project of deepening American democracy, more power to more people in more ways. We are in the business of making it easier for people to co-create our nation, to have a voice in the forces that govern our lives, to flip the script on fate. So many of us feel in this movement like we're in a time right now where there's a malaise, an interregnum, a holding pattern for the movement. But what never ceases to give me hope is the fact that the nation we imagine, the deeper democracy that we pine for for this country already exists in the present. It's just in pieces, scattered in various experiments and rebellions and countercultures and initiatives in states and cities across the country. And our task is to foster these alternatives, to grow them and to spread them. This summit is a celebration of the policies and strategies and people that are doing just that. And I hope you come away with inspiration and useful takeaways to continue this movement in the States. I have the great honor of giving a special thanks to the people who made this happen. Special thanks to Jeff Bai and Mike Sadler on the Deepen team for helping put this together. A huge thanks to the Deepen heroes behind State House Futures leadership. That's Tyler G. Hall and Mike Draskovich for leading on this. And at BISC, we are our, our co-sponsor here. We're so grateful for Jonna and Marsha. And at the Run for Something Action Fund, we're so grateful for Marsha and Whitney and Ben and Sarai and Craig, who have done so much to help bring together policy and strategy in such a powerful way today. Um, a few logistics notes uh, about what we're in right now. We're in a thing called Hopin. It's designed to feel like a real physical conference. So you'll notice on the left bar over here, over there on the left bar. That's how you navigate. Most of the time that will involve being in sessions. There's going to be two sessions going on at the same time, most of the conference today. Um, and they're switching every 40 minutes. You click on the session to get to the one you need to go to. There's also the main stage, which you're in right now. You come back to that for the keynote in the middle of the day and the closing at the end. There's an expo after the closing where you can talk to BISC or Deepin about our organizations. And within each session, we want this to be participatory. There's a chat and there's a full event chat. Shout out where you're calling in from. Shout out questions. There's closed captioning info in the additional bo uh, info boxes within every session. And just a reminder, it is not too late to tell your friends to come over to statehousefutures.org and join us. It is not too late. So we have two keynotes coming up from amazing people and then the sessions are going to begin. But I'd first like to hand it over to our co-host at the wonderful Ballot Initiative Strategy Center, BISC. Um, so over to you, Chris Melody Fields Figueredo. Thanks so much, Pete. I'm so glad to be here with y'all. Again, I can see in the chat all the amazing places everybody's coming from. Louisiana, Maryland, Michigan, Chicago, New York, California, keep it coming. We want to see the amazing state leaders from all across the United States who are ready to build power in the states. Because, y'all, like we got a lot ahead of us, our democracies at state. Y'all know, y'all know this. And the way we're going to transform our country, the way we can truly build power is in the states. That is our closest action that we have to make real changes. Um, and we believe that it is so important through ballot measures to create a tool for liberation, to give this tool of direct democracy straight to the people and give us the agency to dream, to think about what are the policies that we need? 
and the, give us a seat at the table to make that, especially queer folks who are under attack right now, especially folks of uh, 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 the people of color, especially immigrant communities. We have to be at these these policy making tables. We are the closest to the pain, so that means we're the closest to the solution. And ballot measures are just one of many ways that give us the tool, the power, the agency to make that change at a local level, at a state level, and work in our state houses. I believe that ballot measures are a way for us to co-govern together with our representatives and governments to dream together, to hold each other accountable, and to make that, those powerful changes. You know, I have the privilege of leading BISC and working with our amazing team that you'll get to hear on uh, panels today. Uh, Pete gave a shout out, but I have to give a shout out to Jan and Marsh, who's been working with um, the State House Futures team to get us here today. Um, and our amazing team, Sarah Walker, Mila, uh, Gina, who will be presenting today. Um, I want to leave you with a quote from Grace Lee Boggs. Um, the one that I've been meditating on for the last couple of months, really after the, the su Supreme Court decisions at the end of June around affirmative action, student loan debt, and LGBTQ um, rights. And one of the things that Grace Lee Boggs said is, you don't choose the times you live in, but you choose who you want to be. And that's, I think, a call to action to all of us right now. Who do we want to be in this moment? And how do we build towards a future that we haven't seen in our lives? I choose to be a light bearer. I choose to create loving and safe spaces for all of us, especially those who have been marginalized. And in this path to creating a real, truly inclusive democracy, we all have to be light bearers. So I am so gr grateful to be a part of this, to partner again with DPN and run for something. And with that, I'll turn it over to Amanda. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Pete. Um, I am so excited. To, this is our third ever uh, State House Futures event, our biggest one yet. I want to thank Pete and the Democracy Policy Network's um, team for leading the charge on this, and Chris and Bisk for being such incredible partners in this work. It takes all of us. It takes ballot measures. It takes policy wonks. It takes candidates like the ones Run for Something works with all across the country to actually build power, to win, to govern, to make life better in a meaningful way for folks. Um, this conference, this summit is all about what's happening on the state and local level. It's the places where we often say the further down the ballot, the closer to people's homes, the closer to your hearts, the closer to your lives. The issues we're going to be talking about today, the conversations we're going to be having are not some abstraction. They're not the kinds of things you might see on cable news, but they're the kinds of things where it's affordable housing, it's restorative justice, it's four day work weeks. It's things that can make your life meaningfully better. So I am so thrilled that Run for Something Action Fund is able to be a part of this. I want to do another shout out to our incredible team who makes this possible. Marsha, Sari, Craig, Ben, Whitney, and everyone else. This is a really big deal to pull this off, the third year running, and I, I can't wait for the conversations today. Um, for those of folks who don't know, Run for Something Action Fund is part of the Run for Something Network. We recruit and support young, diverse progressives running for state house, state senate, city council, school board, library board, and the kinds of positions that, as I mentioned, really make a difference in people's lives. And Run for Something specifically works with young people, with diverse leaders, because we know that we need more folks who, as Chris so elegantly said, who are closest to the pain can be closest to the solution. Your experience as a young person navigating the housing market right now is wildly different than someone of our parents or grandparents' age. Your experience navigating your reproductive planning or your uh, health care or your affordability for your education policies, all of that directly informs the way that you will govern. So the conversations that these policy and this summit today will help us shape how we can make sure that life is better, not just for us, but for our communities and for people like us. We especially want to make sure that we have younger, diverse leaders in state legislative offices. You know, the average state legislator is like 56 years old. That's not <laughs> where the American people are at anymore. Um, to date, Run for Something has helped elect more than 800 people across all 50 states, including more than 200 state legislators, um, a bunch of whom you're going to hear from today. Senators Megan Hunt, Georgia Senator Nabila Islam, Representative Philip Ensler, uh, Representative Esther Agbaje, who are incredible. 
And they all start off just like you if you're not already an elected, someone who cares about solving problems. Um, we hope that today serves as a catalyst for you, that if you come away from this thinking about running for office or thinking about getting involved in state or local government, or you're already involved and thinking about your next step, that this is a moment that sparks an idea for you to take action. Um, I am thrilled to be able to introduce our first keynote speaker for today, uh, Michigan Senator Mallory McMorrow. Run for Something started working with Senator McMorrow back in 2018 um, when she beat out an incumbent to win and flip her seat in the state Senate. Um, since then, she has been a leader in Michigan fighting for progressive values, fighting for families, fighting for kids, leading the charge on abortion rights, on gun reform, on expanding civil rights. Uh, we are so, so proud that she is being recognized today as a State House Futures Champion for her incredible work. Um, and she is just getting started. Senator McMorrow, take it away. Thank you, Amanda. And hello to everybody joining from all across the country. Uh, hello from the great state of Michigan. It's so exciting. It is such an exciting time to be in state legislatures. You know, I think that this Supreme Court on the federal level, they made a huge mistake, y'all, when they decided that their big play was to kick so many of our fundamental issues to the states. They thought that that was going to be a win for far right conservatives to take our rights away, but they misstepped and they misstepped big. You may know me from a speech that I gave last year in the wake of a sitting colleague uh, accusing me of being a groomer and a pedophile in order to fundraise for herself. It was the worst example of this horrendous culture war moment that we live in right now. And the day that that email went out, I was at a meeting in my district with high school students. And there was a young girl in high school, 15, who she asked me, why are there all these bills targeting the LGBTQ community? And by the end of the conversation, she said to me, I'm queer, why does my state hate me? And it was just such a gut punch and really made me reflect on the fact that however bad I felt for one day is how bad it feels every single day if you are a member of a marginalized community, if you are somebody who is constantly under attack and just wants to live. So that was a lot of the inspiration that went into the speech that I gave on the Senate floor the next day that within 24 hours, 12 million people saw. By the end of the week, I was on the phone with President Biden, uh, talking to Democrats all across the country. And something that I have been so thrilled to be able to do is take that moment, take something horrible and help turn it into a movement. So I opened a PAC. Uh, we raised $2.5 million over the course of the year from April through November. And we helped flip control of the state Senate here in Michigan for the first time in my lifetime, for the first time since 1984. And Michigan, one of the most consequential swing states in the country, is now governed by a Democratic trifecta led by all women. So I want to just run down the list of the things that we've been able to accomplish because it is the power of what we are able to do in state legislatures. In the first six months alone, we have passed more bills into law than the past six Six legislatures combined. We have been at a rapid pace. I know our neighbors in Minnesota have been as well. We have repealed our 1931 abortion ban. We've expanded civil rights to explicitly protect LGBTQ Michiganders. We repealed the retirement tax on seniors. We expanded EITC to lift thousands of families out of poverty. Uh, we have made huge strides towards universal pre-K. We have a record investment in public education, universal free breakfast, and lunch for all students students sweeping gun violence reform, including universal background checks, safe storage, red flag law, something that I have been working on since before I even ran for office. A friend of mine uh, was shot and killed in the Virginia Tech shooting. So it is something so deeply personal. And just 48 hours after the Michigan State shooting, when we had students come from four miles away on their campus to their state capital, our state capital, as horrible as it was, I cannot tell you how much it meant to be able to look these kids in the eyes and promise that this time we were going to take action and we were going to do something about it. And we have, and we're just getting started. So we talked a little bit about ballot measures and something that I think Michigan is a perfect example of is this did not happen overnight. I continue to do national media. You see, may see me on MSNBC every now and then. 
And I think there's this perception nationally that it was just the flip of a switch and it's not what happened. 40 years of people believing that we could get progressive younger people into office, of believing that despite horrific gerrymandering, we could make progress. And then with the help of thousands of volunteers and organizations like Promote the Vote, who I saw in the comments popping in, voters, not politicians, putting ballot measures on the ballot to, in Michigan, create an independent citizens redistricting commission, which finally gave us a fair playing field where we knew that we had the right candidates, the right issues. So we ran, we ran hard, and we won. We had a ballot initiative to codify abortion as a constitutional right in the state of Michigan, something that led to more signatures turned in on this ballot initiative than any single issue for any ballot measure in state history. If there was any lesson from 2022, do not piss off women. We are here, we are ready, and we are not going to let a far-right extremist Supreme Court take our fundamental rights away. So a little bit about kind of my background, because I know that for so many of you who may be watching this, it may feel so daunting that you don't know where to get started. You don't know how to step in. And just a few years ago, before I got to know run for something, I remember waking up in the wake of the 2016 election here in Michigan, when despite every belief, Michiganders elected Donald Trump to be president. There was a video that went viral shortly after the 2016 election of middle school students chanting, build that wall at another student. And that was Royal Oak Middle School, which was my polling place. That was my backyard. It was my hometown. And there was something about the fact that it was kids that just broke me. I had never been involved in politics in a meaningful way before. I'd always paid attention. I always voted. I always watched debates. Uh, but I was a car designer. I ran a creative graphic design consultancy. I had never done this before. So I Googled how to run for office. I started downloading a few guides. I found organizations like Emerge America, which recruits and drains Democratic women to run for office. I found Run for Something. Uh, I submitted my information. I told them who I was and Run for Something was my very first endorsement, which as somebody who has never done it before, it validated who I was. It validated my campaign. And we took on a Republican incumbent in a Republican district and we won over a year and a half. It was a huge upset. We worked so hard. And it was really just in showing up and being passionate and caring about what people listen to. We learned so much as we went. So my final message to you, wherever you are is exactly where you need to be right now. You don't have to know everything. You're going to learn it as you go. Just take another step and another step. Find your people find your values. And the fact that you're here right now means that you are about to do some incredible things and help us save our democracy. So I am so thrilled to join you. It's incredible to see the change that we've seen here in Michigan from my first four years toiling away in the minority, not being able to pass anything to how much progress we're making. And we're going to be the model that I hope the rest of the state and the rest of the country follows. I saw somebody chime in saying that they're from effed up Florida. Uh, hello, you are going to be the one who makes it less effed up. You are the one who is called to do this. And I can't wait to join you in this journey. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Run for Something. Thank you, everybody, for putting this on. I hope you all are inspired today and that we hit the ground running and we take our country back. Thank you so much, Senator. We move on to our final keynote of the day, which is of a similar spirit. Uh, all of those in the audience, I don't know if you heard, but a miraculous thing happened in St. Paul, Minnesota last session. A slim governing majority backed by a supportive governor decided to govern. They passed paid family and medical leave, sick leave, restoration of voting rights, billion dollar investment in affordable housing. They legalized pot, they expanded education funding. They're gonna have a carbon free electric grid. They're going to have non-compete agreements and labor contracts. They're protecting construction workers and meat packers. They made prison phone calls free and established a universal school breakfast and lunch program. My asthma is going to get to me before I list off more, so I'm going to stop it there. We love to see it. The American Prospect has called them the new Minnesota Vikings. We are so happy to have here today to share more 
about what we can learn from this Minnesota way, one of these amazing Vikings, a new generation of leadership in the Minnesota legislature to share this story, State Representative Esther Agbaje. Esther, over to you. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, that was <laughs> such a great introduction. I probably couldn't have said it better myself. But hello, everyone uh, who's at the State House Futures Conference today. Um, as Pete said, my name is Esther Agbaje, and I'm a state representative from Minnesota. My district covers parts of downtown Minneapolis and a neighborhood known as North Minneapolis. And I'm currently serving in my second term, and it's a pleasure to join you here today. Um, thanks also to Senator McMorrow. It was wonderful to hear what our uh, sister state in Michigan is also doing with their trifecta. And so I'm gonna talk to you a little more about Minnesota's most recent legislative session under a democratic trifecta. It's been called our second miracle, transformational, historic, impactful, all of the words. While we worked hard for our victory in 2022, it was definitely a welcome surprise. I remember being up late on election night thinking I should start getting ready for bed after watching the returns come in and checking for Twitter for updates. And just as I was going through one last scroll, sometime around 12 or 1 a.m., I saw a tweet from the Minnesota DFL that the Senate had flipped. Well, I said I knew I was going to be up for a couple more hours that night. But it was a great moment because suddenly we could dream boldly and take advantage of the opportunity before us to make a real difference in Minnesotans' lives and show that progressive policies are not divisive, but sometimes the bare minimum for people who are struggling to get by. One thing Minnesota has done that I believe helped us make the most of our trifecta is that we have been planning with activists, organizations and voters about what legislation they wanted to see. That effort was called the Minnesota Values Project. And we had been doing this for multiple years and had plans and bills ready to go that we could get drafted and start the legislative, legislative process on day one. This group continued to organize throughout the session to keep us on track and ensure that the message about what the DFL was doing was coming not only from voices of elected officials, but people who would be positively affected by these new laws. These organizations also helped us put outside pressure on certain legislators or even the governor if anyone was nervous about how much we were moving. We had a big goal of passing 30 main caucus bills and we got every single one of them passed in some shape or form. Um, Pete listed a lot of them, but I'll go through a bigger list. Um, we did the PRO Act, which codified reproductive freedom in Minnesota. We had a Democracy for the People Act to ensure that more people had access to the ballot box to make their voices heard and updated some of our campaign finance laws. We had funding for first-generation homebuyers and also a state-funded voucher program to make safe and dignified housing in more reach for more people. We need school lunch and breakfast free, paid family medical and earn sick and safe time so that workers know that they can take care of themselves or loved ones without missing out on a paycheck restoring the right to vote to those released from prison, banning conversion therapy so that everyone can live as their authentic selves, and funding to remove lead from our water pipes, and finally, driver's licenses for all to make sure that everyone, including our undocumented neighbors, could get a driver's license, and so much more, which you'll hear about later. Passing these bills gave a real sense of what governing from a people-centered perspective can look like in Minnesota. In the Minnesota State Capitol, we had joyful demonstrations as our community watched and waited through the debates for the final votes. We sang, we danced, we chanted on all of the major days. And my favorite day was when we had dancers representing the Latino community come out on the day we voted for the driver's licenses. The session also had the highest number of legislators from diverse backgrounds. We had our first transgender and non-binary legislators and a number of legislators who came together to form the Queer Caucus to ensure that LGBTQIA Two-Spirit folks were also considered in all of our legislation. The People of Color and Indigenous Caucus, which was officially formed in 2017, was the biggest yet in Minnesota history, with 30 legislators across the House and Senate from the Democratic Party participating in the caucus. As a co-chair of the Posse Caucus this session, we knew that this was the moment to advance equitable policies to begin to create a Minnesota where all people, 
so welcome. Leading a group of 20 legislators in the House was a new but a welcome challenge for me. As the co-chair, I also had a second co-chair and the vice chair, and the three of us helped to ensure that BIPOC priorities were not only being discussed, but addressed in our budget bills and new undertakings like legalizing marijuana. What also made our session successful is that a number of our key committee chairs were held by people of color. For example, we passed the Crown Act, making Minnesota the 20th state to ban hair discrimination. It was the first bill heard in our Judiciary Committee because the chair, an indigenous woman, understood the importance of that civil right and having it go up as one of the first bills to be signed in, to be passed and signed into law to support BIPOC Minnesotans. We did have our share of setbacks and roadblocks in the session, but at least in the House, we continued to fight for each of our communities and not allow the status quo to divide us and fight amongst ourselves. When it came to environmental justice provisions in our environment budget bill, some people wanted to divide rural Posse Caucus members from urban Posse Caucus members and saying that pollution was only an urban inner city issue. But we stood strong to our leadership to say that unless measures were put in place to protect an already polluted and exploited communities across the state, it would be unlikely that the bill would pass. So though we still had to find some compromises, we were successful in ensuring that this policy would be put in place for our major cities and towns across the state. Climate change and pollution know no geographic boundaries, and we will continue to work until the whole state of Minnesota requires studies that allow communities to push back against industry projects that would be detrimental to their environment and their health. Despite challenges, I'm glad to say that the Posse Caucus passed such bills that offered an ethnic studies curriculum in schools, provided alternatives to exclusionary discipline, expanded our Medicare, known as Minnesota Care Health System, to undocumented children and adults, limited the use of no-knock warrants, increased the budgets and pay for public defenders and civil legal aid attorneys, invested millions of dollars for BIPOC businesses and community organizations, especially those who were impacted by the civil unrest following the murder of George Floyd. We provided funding for emerging BIPOC farmers to obtain land, allowed I-10 filers to be eligible for our working family tax credit, and we've updated our tenants' rights laws for the first time in at least 40 years, if not more, to ensure that a more level playing field was in the courts and we were able to hold landlords accountable. The Posse Caucus alongside our Native Caucus also led on legislation to ensure that should ICWA fall at the Supreme Court, our Indigenous children would be protected and we'd be able to stay with their relatives. These posse-focused bills, while primarily directed at making sure that we improve the quality of life for Black and Brown Minnesotans, is also going to improve the quality of life for every Minnesotan and reduce costs across the state. When progressive policies amplify the needs of those who have been historically excluded from participating, we make life better for all of us. So now that you've heard the story and the laundry list of all that we've accomplished, what can you take back home? Well, first, DFL and the Posse Caucus reorganized. We were in coordination with our community and with our voters. And the bills we passed were things people had wanted for years. And despite our small margins, three votes in the House and one in the Senate, we stuck together. And that was through the help of our leaders to make sure that we were delivering for our constituents. Second, we did it with the conviction that we knew that if we held back now, we may not get another chance. It was one of the regrets from when the DFL had a trifecta 10 years ago that they left policy on the table. And third, we did it with joy. This work is hard and there are challenges at every turn, but it is also joyful to know that we are doing our part to make significant positive changes in our communities. And while we weren't successful in everything, we know that there's still more work to do and we have strong advocates who will be there alongside us. Progressive policies are popular policies. People want their kids to be fed, have safer streets, clean water, and affordable and dignified places to live. And when we work together by organizing and sharing our message, we win. I hope that what we did in Minnesota will continue and will continue to do will be an inspiration to all of you, whether you're working inside or outside your state capital. It was people who put in place the systems that currently harm us and it will be the power of people that will dismantle 
and build a different system to heal us now. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference and I look forward to opportunities to fight for and pass laws based on many of the ideas that I'm sure will get generated here today to build the just and inclusive society that we all deserve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative. So appreciate the story of how uh, this magnificent thing in Minnesota happened and how we can bring it to other states across the country. Hello, everybody. I am thrilled that I get to introduce our next awardee, Arika Bennett-Scott. This is an extraordinary individual who is working in coalition to reinstate Mississippi's ballot initiative process after it was dismantled by their court system. Arika is the executive director of Mississippi Votes, an organization committed to civic engagement of Mississippians across generations, cultures, identities, inequities, and struggles with a particular focus on young people. Through this organization, Arika has been working on addressing voter disenfranchisement, voter ID laws, rural voter turnout, and increasing voter participation in all elections. She also advises political aspirants and candidates seeking office on civic engagement strategy. Arika is a graduate of Jackson State University where she co-founded GIRL, a black feminist collective on campus. She pursued her advocacy for, of comprehensive sex education, reproductive rights, and youth political action as a youth champion with Rise Up in, two, in 2017, and has also served as a community youth organizer for the Mississippi Safe Schools Coalition, a member of the Coalition for Economic Justice, and a volunteer lobbyist with Planned Parenthood Southeast. She remains active in developing and nurturing a Black feminist political space and policy agenda with GIRL through Mississippi Votes' new initiative, One Girl, One Vote. Please join me in welcoming our 2023 Defender of Direct Democracy awardee, Arika Bennett-Scott. Thank you, Marsha. Wow. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's such an honor to be recognized in this way as this year's Defender of Direct Democracy. I am overwhelmed with joy and gratitude I'm a Mississippi girl who is in love with the idea of democracy being actualized. The breadth of the work of Mississippi Votes is a commitment to our people from our mutual aid work, making sure folks have clean water and safe housing, as well as access to reproductive care. Uh, Mississippi Votes has been on the front lines of social justice issues, noting that we can't change an election if we don't change people's material conditions that support their ability to even think about participating in the electoral process. It's through the lens of the thousands of young folks across the state of Mississippi that call Mississippi Votes their political home that I am inspired and hopeful for what's possible in our experiment of democracy and frankly, in our world. I'd be remiss if I did not acknowledge my team of incredibly amazing millennial organizers, strategists, mm -hmm. data scientists, and policy analysts, all from and of Mississippi soil. It goes without saying that my entire team, can I say badass, is badass. <laughs> Together, we've registered over 72,000 voters statewide, turned out a record number of young people to vote in every election in Mississippi since 2018, and made significant policy impacts at the state legislative level. We are the largest youth civic engagement movement in Mississippi since Freedom Summer 1965. The commitment we have to each other and our collective work is deeply personal. Mississippi is personal. Fighting for democracy is personal. We find ourselves in tears when we talk amongst ourselves about what's possible. It's always hard doing what we do in a place that doesn't seem to love us the way we love it. So camaraderie had to become our remedy. Coalition has been our antidote and community has been our balm our source of healing, inspiration, and the ever-present reminder that this fight we are in is about people's literal lives. It's not a plaything. it's not ideological, it's for real. People's lives are on the line each and every day we choose to be something other than a real democracy. So we've all got work to do. Mississippi Votes recognizes that. And so we've been doing so much work to make sure that folks have clear, concise, and accessible information about what's at stake, especially with Mississippi's ballot measure process. 
Whew. In 2021, for those of you who don't know, I'm going to just give a brief history, right? So in 2021, Mississippi's ballot measure process was struck down by the Mississippi Supreme Court and has not been restored. The people of Mississippi have used the tool of the ballot measure process since 1992 to demonstrate their power, to have a say on issues they care about aside from party affiliation or candidate bias. The tool was struck down on a very easy to fix technicality. In short, when our ballot measure process was introduced or written, we had five congressional districts. After 2010 census, we lost the congressional district. And as the ballot measure process was written, in order to qualify as a measure, a petition must be circulated to gather signatures to place the measure on the next statewide general elections ballot. According to state law, and as interpreted by the, Supreme, the Mississippi Supreme Court, for an initiative measure to be placed on the ballot, a minimum of 106,000 or so certified signatures must be gathered, with no more than 20% of the total gathered signatures coming from one congressional district. Okay, so this math is in line with the five congressional districts we previously had, not the four we currently have thus making our process invalid according to the Mississippi State Supreme Court decision that came down in May of 2021. And be clear, this only happened after the power of ballot measures was uniquely demonstrated at the height of a global health crisis, the election of 2020, when in spite of all that year has meant or did mean to each of us, Mississippians, irrespective of party lines, voted in favor of three progressive ballot measures. One, to remove the Confederate emblem from our state flag. Two, to remove a Jim Crow constitutional provision. And three, to legalize medical marijuana. The math started to math to the powers that be that people would save themselves through the ballot measure process. Communities started talking about Medicaid expansion and rights restoration as future initiatives. The Mississippi State Legislature has had two opportunities to restore the ballot measure process since 2021 by simply amending the language. Instead, our overwhelmingly conservative white Republican supermajority state legislature has played in our faces. They've introduced bills that would in theory restore the ballot measure process for their power, their benefit. Bills that would give us a ballot measure process, but increase the number of signatures we'd have to collect to even get to the ballot as a measure. And many other provisions that would be what we feel is an incredible amount of legislative overreach. Long story short, my team and our community, our volunteers and partners were like, nah. And so with the love and trust we have in each other, uh, we built a statewide movement that created barriers for legislators to create barriers to our electoral process. Listen, the power of organizing is so delicious. You got to get into it because every single day during the 2022 and 2023 legislative sessions, we blew up the call lines. We emailed every legislator in Mississippi at least five times a day. That's five emails to each legislator coming from at least 10 people per day. We packed the galleries of each chamber, demonstrated and vocalized that we would not be silenced and that the power of the people must prevail. Because of that organizing, that people power, we have defeated every bill that was anti-democratic through our community organizing and legal strategies. We defeated both, both of those bills that would restore the ballot initiative process that were not the people-centered ballot initiative restoration bills that we wanted. This year, as we do each year, we're working with our partners and community members to develop a policy agenda that centers the people's desires for a ballot initiative process. We're hosting meetings and events with legislators in, host, in hopes that they adopt our agenda and proposals to restore the ballot initiative process with, for, and by the people. Restoring the ballot measure process without legislative overreach or hoops and bounds or vagueness holds immense promise for expanding access to so many possibilities for our very quality of lives. In Mississippi, this process could re-enfranchise hundreds of thousands of potential voters. It could ensure access to quality health care and fully fund public education. The, the ballot measure process, from my perspective, is dem democracy at work. It's the essence, the core essence of the will of the people 
being processed. I am so excited about the fight ahead. I'm excited and I'm prepared to win. We've got to prepare to win, y'all. I'm hopeful and will remain faithful to my community, to the promise of what I know Mississippi is and can be, to the idea of freedom, liberation, and democracy that my grandparents believed in, and the promise so long for those of us who are in it, breathing it, living it. But I encourage you that we are almost there. And I've got news for you. White supremacy is on its very last leg. We can win. We have to. So stay the course. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arika. That was an amazing speech. So inspiring and really just from the bottom of my heart, from the whole team here at the Balanced Strategy Center. Thank you for the fight that you are leading. We, like you, believe that democracy is for the people. And when we come together, we can do amazing things. So thank you so much.